Key concepts for costume design. I'm going to start by talking about why I think there's more to consider as a costumer than other designers. I'm going to go over the parts of the costume, the responsibilities of the costume designer. Then we're moving on to makeup design and hair, the purposes of stage makeup, and responsibility of the makeup designer. There's more to consider than other designers as a costumer. Yeah, I said that. Other designers are going to argue and disagree. But here's the thing. The costumer functions with actors in a way that the other designers simply do not. Um, we have to deal with character analysis, the director, and the actor's choices um, in a very cohesive, collaborative manner that, you know, as a set designer, you just don't have to do that. You're not doing the same level. Yes, you are considering the characters, the environment they live in, all of those things, but certainly not with as much detail and as directly in collaboration with the actors as a costume designer. So here's some things that most people don't always realize are part of the costumer's job. Um, because what you wear beneath your actual, what we consider clothing, our outer garments, um, because undergarments affect the shape and the look of our clothing, Costumers need to know and are responsible for all undergarments. Now, today that's not necessarily a big deal because we um, we don't wear as many undergarments that shape the body. I mean, unless you're wearing Spanx, and I know there's a growing trend with uh, corsets again, but uh, you'll see I have images here of different undergarments. These are from the 19th century. But uh, these other un these undergarments, <laughs> they really do become an important and sometimes a very tedious part of your job as a costumer because, yeah, you're responsible for undergarments, outer garments, headwear. Now that means, yeah, hats, scarves, um, wigs, to pays. All headwear is the responsibility of the costumer. Even if it's something like wigs that are very extravagant from a specific time period like the 17th century, uh, you might hire someone who's specifically doing all of your wigs. You might be hiring a milliner who is doing all of your hats. Um, but that still falls under the purview of the costume designer. Everybody has to answer to the costume designer because you want everything to match and look good together. You are responsible for footwear. That includes men's, women's. It is all the different kinds of footwear. Side note here, it's also um, the responsibility of the costume designer to make sure the actors have adequate rehearsal time with that footwear, with their shoes, because it's going to change the way that they move. As the costume designer, uh, parts of the costume, you are responsible for accessories, jewelry, uh, gloves, all of those tiaras, all of those extra things um, again, that's a part of the costume. That is your job. Specialized costumes. Certainly if you've been watching Masked Singer or if you've seen any of the costumes from the Disney universe, it is the costumer's job to make that or figure out or hire someone to make that. Just because it is um, a specialized costume, that doesn't mean there is a separate designer who is doing that work. That's still your responsibility and it's your responsibility with all of these parts of the costumes to be aware of any kind of quick changes. Make the clothing that needs to be changed quickly in a way that it can be changed quickly. 
either using Velcro or faster closers or, you know, something that maybe wasn't used during the time period, but you can hide it. And um, it will still help you quick change between scenes if you need to. Um, okay, moving on. So responsibilities of the costumer. The one of the first things you're doing is a character analysis. Now, character analysis, you have done one as a, a student as far as acting, but when you are a costumer, you're really looking at things that affect what we choose to wear. Um, age, social function, attitude. Um, by attitude, I mean, is this a happy person or is this a really sarcastic, unhappy, always wears black, you know, that kind of person. Nationality. At different times throughout our history, of course, people in different countries have worn different types of clothing. Passage of time. Is this someone who starts out as a college student, ends up as a CEO? Uh, throughout the play, you want to show that in the clothing that that character is wearing. Uh, family relationships. Social economic ca um, class will definitely tie families together. Is this a farming family? Is this a family who lives in a big city? All of these things. Now, here's where it can get kind of complicated because obviously the director has an opinion about the character and what that character is like. The actors, they've done a character analysis. They're portraying that character. They have very strong opinions about what that character is like. Again, as the costumer, it is your job when you're doing your character analysis, you start with the script, but you must make sure, and with the director you have pre-production meetings for this, you want to make sure that your ideas and what you feel about the characters in relation to the things I've just listed are valid, that that's what they're keeping in the play, that they have not decided to change a character radically from maybe how the playwright had originally written that character. You want to touch base with the actor. Sometimes it's good. Watch a couple of early rehearsals and get a feel for the direction that they're going. Um, your job, too, is to convey your ideas to the other people involved with the production, the director, actors, lighting designer especially. Um, so you want to do renderings. With swatches, that's little bits of the fabric that you're cho choosing to use. There are lots of sketches. Thumbnails are when you do small, um, usually fully colored uh, drawings that show the relationship between the different characters. Um, you know, I have a cosplay is becoming a really big deal. A lot of people really understand this how to do quick sketches and then you want to, and in the next slide you'll see, a variety of full costume renderings. Here's some examples of full costume renderings. Um, you'll notice that these are not like fashion drawings where it shows uh, the body in movement and it's very artistic and is about the, the mood and the, and the overall look of the design. With costumers, that stuff's important, but it's more important that you can see specifics, details, fas uh, fasteners. Um, you want people to be able to look at your designs and know what to construct, what to make with having to go back to you to ask questions as little as possible. Continuing with the responsibilities of the costume designer, um, it is your job, I've talked about collaboration a lot, but it's your job to coordinate with the scenic and lighting designer. You want to know about textures. For example, you don't want to put someone in silky, very um, easily damaged fabric, if they're going to be sitting on, say, a raw bench, an unsanded surface, something that can damage that fabric. 
You want to coordinate colors, especially with the lighting designer. Uh, you do not want to have colors that will change under the lighting choices of the lighting designer. You want to make sure if you're doing a musical or if you have actors who are doing stage combat that their clothing is going to allow them to move around as they need to move around. Even something as simple as getting on their knees and standing back up. Do you, do you want them in looser slacks or maybe a, a skirt that allows them uh, to get down and get back up with ease. So you're doing a lot of coordinating with a lot of other people. Um, you want to work closely with your makeup designer. Now, most professional theaters are going to have a makeup designer on staff. If you're working in community theater, you as the costumer will often be in charge of makeup as well. Uh, so be aware of that and plan for it. You know, makeup changes uh, stylistically, as does hair, which is also falls under the purview of the costume designer. Um, it also changes with fashion through different times. It's historical. So you want to make sure that you're working toward that goal as, as well as all of the clothing. Um, you must supply rehearsal garments. If you're doing a play where the clothing is going to be dramatically different than the actors would be wearing on a daily basis, I mentioned shoes earlier, you want to make sure, if you can, to supply like women with uh, hoop skirts. There are different times in history when men have worn high heel shoes. Gosh, you know, guys today, they're not all good at walking in high-heeled shoes. So you need to make sure that your actors have these rehearsal garments. Corsets, if a woman's not used to wearing a corset, they're not going to be able to breathe. So you're going to make sure that they have the opportunity to learn that during rehearsals. So as the costumer, it is your job to make sure the, cat, the costumes actually show up, that they're there. Um, this is done in a variety of ways. You'll see I have listed here construction. You make the costumes. Uh, you employ seamstresses, drapers, cutters. Cutters are the people who make the pattern from the actual costume design. Cut out all the fabric. Um, they're the, probably the most skilled workers in a costume shop. Um, Sometimes if you're working for a theater that has a lot of costumes from previous productions, they have good costume storage, you can pull from that storage and alter it for the show and to fit the actor. Lots of rental houses you can rent. I rent especially um, a lot of older men's costumes or... I did a show where I needed 1940s police uniforms. I rented those. You can also go out and just, you know, purchase clothing. So you're doing all of those things in conjunction to make sure you have the actual costumes. Now again, I gave you a list of all of the parts of the costume. You've got to make sure whatever you have as the actual costume, you have the correct undergarments for that costume, the correct accessories with that costume. Um, hair, hat, scarves, coats, gloves, jewelry, crowns, all of these different things can be a part of the costume. Be aware of what's going to be hard to find so that you give yourself enough time to make it if you can't find it. Uh, don't procrastinate, especially when it comes to accessories. Because, you know, I've been in a costume shop at 4 the, in the morning gluing little gems with hot glue on a tiara and because I didn't think about it. And I thought, oh, that won't take very long. No, those little things end up taking uh, twice as much time as you usually expect. Now... Some people get confused between what is a prop and what is a costume accessory. Um, for example, a briefcase is a prop. A purse 
is a costume accessory. And here's why. Anything that stays with the actor and changes with fashion, like purses, wallets, uh, uh, fans that women used to carry. You see I have an image here of uh, someone who has a parasol. Those things are actually costume accessories because they go with the outfit. Now, once you've made the costume, the show begins, it is the costumer's job to make sure that the clothing stays in good order. You're constantly doing laundry, mending, sewing buttons on, things like that. It can be never-ending. If it's a Broadway show and a lengthy run, it is the costumer who is constantly still working, 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 ironing, prepping, making sure all of those costumes are still looking good, the actors are having no issues, that things get replaced when they need to get replaced. Again, the costumer has a lot to do. As I mentioned earlier, it is often the costumer's responsibility, especially in community educational theater, um, along with hairstyling, wigs, etc., uh, you're responsible for makeup, making sure that it is being correctly done, uh, historically correct, etc. So the first thing you need to understand about stage makeup is why it is so important. You know, in films, most makeup is um, special effects makeup or just for the female characters. Uh, you'll often hear ma male actors, well, I'm not wearing any makeup, you know, that kind of thing. You know, on stage, yeah, you don't get away with that crap because makeup helps you be seen on stage. Stage lights, uh, the w angles at which they are focused, the intensity of the light uh, can flatten your facial features. Well, as an actor, that's one of the last things you want. You want every facial expression to be visible to your audience. That's what makeup is for, even if you're not doing some kind of like aging, like I have here as examples on the side. Even if you're not trying to visually establish the character's age or the style of the play, the time period of a play, um, you are always trying to do makeup that is helping the actor be visible on stage. And you know what? It also helps the actor in characterization. Here's a big thing about theater that's very different than makeup for film. In theater, the actors apply their own makeup. Even extravagant makeups like in Shrek or things like uh, the musical Cats, they might have people there to help them, but they are a part of that application process. For a lot of actors, that's an important process. I mean, think about it. You've taken a class, most of actors who have any theater education, one of the classes they take their freshman or sophomore year is stage makeup, and you are changing your face to make you look like the character that you're portraying, and that can be a very strong um, effect on you as an actor. It can really aid in your characterization. like the costumer, um, you are doing a character analysis. Now, it's a little bit different. It's focused on things that affect our facial characteristics, such as age, temperament. Are you someone who scowls all the time? I mean, your character. Uh, so you have deeper frown lines. Environment. Is this a character who spends a lot of time out in the sun? Uh, health, etc. These are things that affect our faces, the way we look. Uh, you want to design a makeup that meets the purposes of makeup that I have described. Also, you too are doing renderings, drawings to convey 
your ideas so that your costumer, your actors, director, you're making sure you fit in with the whole director's concept, the overall universe, what that play is supposed to look like, what the costumer and actors have in mind for that character. As a makeup designer, you want your design to be correctly applied by the actors, so you develop a worksheet. There are different kinds of worksheets. The example I give here is probably the most common. And on this, you put notations, um, placement of different makeup techniques like aging. Uh, these worksheets are for the actors. They're translating, basically, your design to the actor's face. Uh, it's your job to help train the actor's assistance and application, make sure they have everything that they need, and that you have provided a hygienic area for them to apply their makeup. You know, most actors, especially when they've gone to college and taken, you know, that beginning stage makeup class, they create their own makeup kit. And, uh, you know, I think the previous slide had an image of that. And in that makeup kit, they have, you know, the foundation colors and the, the makeup that they use the most often. And if they're in a show and they're using makeup colors that are different than what they would normally have in their kit, it's the responsibility of the makeup designer, it's the re responsibility of the people budgeting for that show, that they uh, supply... Uh, or replace the actor's makeup. Uh, as an actor, you don't. You can spend, you know, a, a, a large portion of your salary <laughs> on makeup, and that shouldn't happen. Your theater should be providing and organizing makeup for you to use, and you. If you need any special stuff for skin care, yeah, you can bring that in, but they should also have the basics for washing your face, keeping your skin clean, etc.